All right, well, welcome everyone. This is our second to last class today, and uh, we have a great honor, pleasure to have John Scott, who is the translator of our Rousseau book, here from California Davis. He uh, is a guy who knows a lot about Machiavelli and Rousseau, I think two of the, the highlights of the class. So really looking forward to his talk, and uh, without any more, by way of small talk, here's John Scott. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I was um, saying that I was actually born in Idaho and I uh, left when I was four years old, so I haven't been back in like 20 years. Now. Um, so today I've been asked to talk about uh, Rousseau and modern political thought. I understand your class is modern political thought. You're reading Rousseau right now and have read some of the other people I'm going to talk about a little bit and some people I, ha you haven't read some people I will talk about. Now, <clears throat> I actually decided to title this Rousseau and Modernity. I think the advertised title is and political, modern political thought. But I, I want to say what I mean by modernity when I get there, because I have something specific in mind uh, here that's not just simply about the history of political thought, but rather a, an idea about what modern political thought or modern philosophy more generally is about and how Rousseau fits into that story as a kind of pivotal, I think at least a pivotal thinker. So I also usually don't use PowerPoint, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but I think it's nice to have pictures and stuff to entertain yourselves while you listen to me. Um, let me begin with something I think you, uh, you uh, namely how Rousseau became Rousseau. And this is uh, the, 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 what's called the illumination of Vincent, Vincent being this prison uh, in which Diderot, uh, Rousseau's friend Diderot was imprisoned and Rousseau went one day to visit him and had this sudden inspiration that led to Rousseau becoming Jean-Jacques, to becoming the most famous person in Europe at the time uh, after being a nobody. So Rousseau was born in Geneva in 1712. He eventually makes it to Paris, like everyone who wants to be an artist or a philosopher or an intellectual. He's trying to hard to become an artist, a philosopher, an intellectual, and largely failing uh, until this sort of accidental moment. So later on, he wrote about it this way. I was going to see Diderot, Diderot being his best friend and at the time uh, the editor of the encyclopedia, the Bible of the Enlightenment, let's call it. Um, I was going to see Diderot, at that time a prisoner of Vincennes. I had in my pocket a mercury of France which I began to leave through across, along the way. I felt, I think he's sitting beneath a tree when this happens too, uh, it's, it's completely. Anyhow, uh, I fell across the question of the Academy of Dijon which gave rise to my first writing. In the Academy of the first writing being the Discourse on the Sciences and the Arts, which I believe you read, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, along the way. Later on, he described it, uh, it uh, in the same letter this way. If anything had ever resembled a sudden inspiration, it's the motion that was caused in me by that reading. Oh, sir, he's writing to the head censor of France. If I'd ever been able to write a quarter of what I saw and felt under that tree, how clearly I would have made all the contradictions of the social system seen, and with what strength I would have exposed all the abuses of our institutions, and with what simplicity I would have demonstrated that, quote, man is naturally good, and it is from these institutions alone that he becomes wicked. At the moment of that reading, I saw another universe and became another man. He's clearly pattering this illumination of Vincent, as it's called, on Saul on the way to uh, Damascus, Saul becoming Paul, right? Uh, having this vision that leads him to become a follower rather than a persecutor of, of Jesus Christ. Likewise, Rousseau, the pauvre Jean-Jacques, this would-be intellectual, becomes all of a sudden the man uh, that we know today um, out of obscurity. And the main principle he later explained of all of his writings from this one forward is what I bolded there. Man is naturally good and it's from institutions, from so social institutions alone, he becomes wicked. So clearly, again, if you think about Saul on the road to Damascus, this is a contrary story about original sin. Rousseau is arguing that man is naturally good, not naturally wicked or fallen. And that if he is fallen and corrupted, which he clearly thinks he is, wicked, it's not through you know, human beings' own fault in disobeying God or something like that. It's from the, the structure of our social institutions. So this, this thought is going to lead him to the radical new um, answers to the question of human society, human goodness and happiness and so on. So this writing first 
uh, produced the prize essay, The Discourse on the Sciences and the Arts, that made Rousseau an overnight celebrity. So he writes the uh, essay competition essay, he wins, it's published, and overnight he becomes a sensation. So in 1750, in the middle of the century of enlightenment, best friends with Diderot, the uh, godfather, let's call it, of the enlightenment, Rousseau argues that this, the, the restoration of the sciences and arts has corrupted more. In fact, it's our science and philosophy and art, civilization, let's call it, that leads to our corruption, not to our redemption or our happiness. So this thought is going to carry him through the rest of his career as a writer. And ultimately, his friends, Diderot among them and the other uh, philosophers of the Enlightenment, uh, eventually became aware he was serious. <laughs> you know, this was not a joke that he was arguing this. So uh, it leads to one of his things. So it seems that for the discourse on the sciences and arts, that enlightenment, philosophy, the arts, et cetera, corrupts us. Second discourse, which you're reading now, discourse on inequality, just looking at the frontispiece here, the story seems to be this, um, this fellow hot and hot is throwing away the, you know, the clothing, the garb of civilization, and he's going back to his equals. You can see his hot and hot relatives over here on the shore. So again, the idea seems to be Rousseau is rejecting, in some fashion, rejecting civilization, and he's suggesting that somehow we return to nature or something like that. Now, so what I want to argue in here is that there's truth to this, uh, but the Rousseau is a much more complicated figure than that. Okay? And so that's what the main theme I want to develop here. Here's basically my thesis. Okay? What I'm going to do is state it now. And it's not in, you know, entirely original to me. I'm drawing on other um, scholars of Rousseau here, um, uh, in part at least. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to state what the theses, main arguments I want to make here is, but then take a step back and say, well, what is modernity? And then come back to Rousseau and these theses. So here are the uh, three main ones I want to get. And there, there are others too. And each of them is in many ways a simplification of Rousseau's argument, but I think a good place to start. First, okay. Rousseau was the first great critic of modernity within the modern fold. Okay? And uh, I think you'll get a better sense of what modernity means and so on. But what I mean by this is that uh, for, it's fairly easy, I think, for starters. Um, the idea of enlightenment, uh, of using sciences and arts to better the human condition, right, and, and a progress that are central to the modernity had many critics before Rousseau, but they were all, I would suggest, are all, all, all the most important ones outside of the modern fold. So for example, they were, they were coming at it from a Christian theological position, a theological position, and critiquing the effects of the sciences and arts, for example, on society from that perspective. Or they were coming at it from what's called a classical Republican um, uh, perspective. What Rousseau makes Rousseau unique is he embraces many of the very arguments of modernity and turns them against modernity itself. That's what makes him a turning point in the story. Okay? And many of the thinkers that came after him furthered this critique in various ways that he began. Second, Rousseau attempts <clears throat> to reconstruct virtue, love, beauty, politics, and other things found in pre-modern thought on modern grounds. So his argument is going to be that the thinkers like Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, etc., that I'm going to turn to in a minute, um, all flatten virtue. Right? They flatten virtue, they flatten love, they flatten beauty, they flatten politics in ways that make it a matter of self-interest and calculation and so on and so forth. Rousseau is going to embrace their principles but somehow try to reconstruct these things in meaningful ways. I'll talk about that a little bit too. And finally, Rousseau's critique of modernity had the paradoxical effect of accelerating modernity itself or certain aspects of it. Okay? So you think that the critique of modernity would do something like take us back somehow to pre-modern fashions. No, that's not what happens. It actually accelerates some of the ideas that Rousseau had in later thinkers and, and um, artists and so on. So these are the three basic theses I want to maintain. So again, let's go back to say what modernity means. 
That might be covering a little bit of the same ground you've covered in here, but that's okay uh, to hear it again or in a slightly different way. Just first of all, where does this word come from and what does it mean? Um, so the term modern and enhanced modernity comes from the Latin modo, which means um, current, new. So like you have pie a la mode, you know, it's the current way of having pie. At least back in the 50s, it was the current way of having pie. It's with ice cream, by the way, in case you're wondering. I don't know what a pie a la mode is now, but you uh, get the idea. Uh, or if those of you who are older than, uh, than uh, as old as we are, you might remember the Mod Squad. Uh, so they're the Mod Squad. They're not the old squad, they're the Mod Squad. New, hip, you know, things like this. So this term came to represent an understanding of who we are versus our predecessors were in various ways, including, for example, in the fifth century BCE, a number of the uh, Christian theologians um, of the time, church fathers, thought of the modern as being them, the Christians, as opposed to the pagans from before. So they're self-consciously thinking about it as a period, our period, the Christian period, as opposed to the pre-Christian period, the pagans. But in the 15th century, 16th century, in that period, so the late Renaissance, early modern period, as we would type it, at least in our world, um, it came to mean something slightly different, right? It came to mean the modern versus the ancient, so in part an understanding of period. We live today, they lived then. But I'm much more self-conscious about, well, what is our way of life as compared to the way of life, right? And I'm gonna come back to Machiavelli, on whom I know you've read as an example here, right? And ultimately it comes to mean something like modern versus pre-modern and includes a critique or self-conscious difference or distinction between not only the Christian, excuse me, the classical or ancient past, so we're not Aristotle or something like that, we're not ancient Rome, but also a Christian uh, period. So thinking of it as a new epic that's sort of, let's call it post-Christian, post-ancient uh, in some ways at least, okay? And finally, this came to a coinage at least in English, uh, the earliest known use is the 1620s of the term modernity. And that's what I want to kind of define now. So modernity is not just simply an idea that we live now, they live then. But it's an idea of what we're doing now that's different than what they did then. So again, these are simplifications uh, uh, of the thinkers because there's a, I mean, this is one of the things for me that's really interesting about uh, the Renaissance and Enlightenment periods, or early modern period, is it's really hard to find someone who actually <laughs> thinks all these things in any kind of simple way. So these thinkers are much more nuanced and complex than my labels are gonna make them out to be. I think that's one of the most interesting things about them. But for starters, labels are good. Um, so I would suggest <clears throat> here are some features of modernity and the thinkers and um, others who are involved in it. In, in, number one, a self-conscious critique of the past, of the both ancient and the Christian past. So seeing them as somehow limited uh, uh, in compared to what we're trying to do, at least. And they're self-conscious about it. Um, number two, an idea of progress in some fashion. That somehow by human means of understanding how we differ from them, we can do better. We can harness philosophy, uh, human society in ways that will make it better. Again, that's a simpler thing. And finally, and related to that, <clears throat> a reorientation of philosophy okay, or science. So rather than thinking about philosophy or science, which are synonymous terms in this period, uh, rather than thinking of science and philosophy as about contemplation, for example, of eternal truths, <coughs> or <doesn't. coughs> um, uh, it's the philosophy of science is reoriented toward action, toward changing the world, not just contemplating the eternal truths, but changing the here and now in a very historical kind of way. We want to progress by using the very tools of thought and action to make our world different. So I hope you see the kind of bundling here. By the way, please feel free if there's a you know, question or clarification along the way to ask it. So I just wanted to get the sort of basics of what I mean by modernity, what we mean by modernity, generally speaking, again, it's more nuanced than that. 
Before I turn, uh, now to give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about, some of which may be familiar to you, some of them less familiar. Now I understand you did read Machiavelli's prints and some selections from discourses, so this should be familiar uh, to you. Uh, I like his picture, he looks like someone you'd kind of like to have a, you know, a, like have a nice uh, afternoon drink or coffee with, but you might want to make sure you count your change uh, <laughs> afterward. Okay, a famous statement from chapter 15 of the Prince, I'm sure you remember this. Um, it remains now to see what modes and the government of a prince should be with subjects and with friends, because I know many have written of this. I feel that fear that in writing of it again, I will be held to be presumptuous, especially in since disputing this matter, I depart from the orders of others. So self-conscious novelty, self-conscious critique of the past, the first um, uh, going I gave you. But since my intent is to write something useful, so now we have utility rather than contemplation, uh, to whoever understands it's appeared to me more fitting to go to the effectual <coughs> truth of the thing than to the imagination of it. So what works? Not just contemplating things or imagining uh, principalities and republics that never existed and never will exist, but what actually works? Right, what's useful? How can we understand the world in a way to make it useful and more habitable for us, let's say? Likewise, just a couple, two other brief quotations, one from the Prince. Nor should be considered nothing is more um, uh, uh, difficult to handle, more doubtful success, nor more dangerous to manage than put oneself at the head of introducing new orders. Here he's talking about Moses, Theseus, Cyrus, and Romulus, these great founders. But given what he says in the discourses, next quote, <laughs> You know, I'm doing introducing new modes and orders. Machiavelli himself sees himself as breaking from the past, introducing new modes and orders, new ways of conducting our, our business as human beings in the world. For Machiavelli, particularly on the plane of politics. Okay, so I think that's familiar to you, right? Okay, let me introduce a couple other people very briefly to see how this story continues. Sir Francis Bacon, often known as the sort of father of the modern scientific method. He is in fact writing exactly at the period uh, when uh, the term modernity was introduced into English. I don't think he was the one who did it, um, but he's a good example. Uh, Bacon's also interesting. He's one of the first people to openly praise Machiavelli, this period. Everyone says, oh, Machiavelli's a terrible, evil man. Let me see, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's my, uh, there's another philosopher, um, Spinoza, and one of my favorites is uh, in this famous work, um, uh, the, the author Bale's dictionary, uh, he begins by saying, you know, Spinoza was a good guy, but he said some terrible things. Let me tell you about them. And he goes on for pages and pages telling everyone about these terrible things Spinoza said. Machiavelli's got a similar kind of recommendation here. But Bacon openly praises Machiavelli. But Bacon, again, the father of modern natural science, turns this modern project, the project of modernity, of changing the world from politics and Machiavelli to science. Okay? And he says, nature exhibits herself more clearly under the trials and vexations of art than when left to herself. In other words, what we're gonna do is torture nature to make her reveal her secrets. Bacon was not only the father of modern scientific method of experimentation, torturing nature, he was in charge of torturing people for the English legal system. So he knew something about torture uh, uh, here. And finally, what is the purpose of philosophy or science and the entire project Bacon conceives? The conquest of nature for the relief of man's estate. The purpose is not to contemplate nature, it's to vex and torture her, to make her reveal her secrets, and then use those secrets to better our condition, right? Through medicine, through technology is a term we would use. Um, notice that I put up the frontispiece to the great installation here, which is uh, a boat, a uh, ship going through the Pillars of Hercules, in other words, the Straits of Gibraltar, to go into the open sea to new lands. Because they thought that we, were, we couldn't pass the Pillars of Hercules, either literally, with a boat, or figuratively with our minds. Remember in the, the passage I just put up and didn't read from Machiavelli? He says that what he's doing in introducing new modes and orders is more dangerous than discovering new continents. So there's this imagery of Columbus of, of the mind, and Bacon picks up on that as well. Okay, so we're gonna go beyond the bounds 
of the limits that we've had on us before from our Christian and ancient past, and we're going to have a new path. Another figure, briefly, René Descartes, um, uh, also a scientist, and you know, again here, just one little quotation from the discourse. Did you read the discourse on the method? Some, okay, okay, so this is familiar. Uh, but as soon as I acquired some general notions respecting physics, I observed how far they carry us and how much they differ from the principles been employed up to this present time, self-consciously breaking in the past. I believe that I could not keep them concealed without sinning grievously against the law by which we were bound to promote the general good of mankind. So again, utility, the general good. For by them I perceived it be possible to arrive at knowledge highly useful in life, useful, which we might thus render ourselves the lords and possessors of nature. Okay. So again, the idea here is to transform the world for human benefit. And finally, let me turn uh, just a little bit more to Thomas Hobbes, uh, whom I understand you didn't read, but probably you know, heard about a little bit here. And one of the reasons I'm turning to Thomas Hobbes He's working more on the, on, the, on the plane, largely, of political theory. And he's one of the people that Rousseau is directly responding to. And so it's, he's useful for seeing what Rousseau is trying to do. Okay? So, first of all, let's see Hobbes' definition of philosophy. By philosophy is understood the knowledge acquired by reasoning from the manner of the generation of anything to the properties of it to the end to be able to produce as far as matter and human force permit such effects as human life requirement. In other words, we figure out how things work, right? And then we try and possess the principles that make them work and then make them work for us, you know, for human benefit. So the purpose of philosophy following Bacon in particular here is to better the human condition. And it's thoroughly practical. The purpose of philosophy is to get nature in our hands and make her do stuff for us, rather than contemplate and so on. Hobbes, by the way, worked as a personal assistant to Francis Bacon for a while, so he knew whereof he spoke, as they say. Likewise, but Hobbes wants to turn the methods and vision, let's say, of natural philosophy or science to the human realm, to political theory. <clears throat> and he says, natural philosophy is but young. He met, he knew Descartes, he met Galloway, or he knew these people involved in this project. Natural philosophy is but young, but civil philosophy yet much younger, as being no older than my own book, <laughs> the Kibbe. <laughs> Haas was not a modest man. Uh, he thought that everyone before him, before his book, the Kibbe, uh, didn't know what they were talking about, right? Their, their political science wasn't scientific. He thinks he's put political science on a scientific basis. So he's going to use the methods of natural science to better the human condition by transforming the, the political situation in various ways. Okay. Let me just show you uh, just a, a tad of how this works. This is near the beginning of his most important work for political theory, at least, Leviathan. That when a thing lies still, unless somewhat else stir it, it will lie still forever is a truth no man doubts of. So behold, <laughs> okay? But then when a thing is in motion, pretend that's in motion, okay? I could hurl it across the room, perhaps. Uh, but, but when a thing is in motion, it will eternally be in motion, unless someone else stay it, stop it. Though the reason be the same, namely, that nothing can change itself, is not so easily assented. Okay. So when a body is at rest, it will remain at rest until moved. And when a body is in motion, it will remain in motion until stopped. What do we call that? What's the, what's the principle? We're in the physics building, I understand here. So it's appropriate. What's that principle called? Newton's law of motion. Newton's law of motion or the principle of inertia. Right? It's inertial. It either stays at rest or in motion. Good. By the way, one of the exciting things about reading these works is you get to say stuff like this. This is the first clear articulation and principle of inertia ever. So Galileo, it's premised in Galileo's physics, and then later it's explicit in Newton. The Hobbes in between, Hobbes, our political theorist, is the first person to actually state the principle. So that's, that's pretty cool, <laughs> okay? Uh, so the world is matter in motion for Hobbes. If we can understand the motion, we can 
um, control it, up to a point at least, for human benefit. <clears throat> Let's look at Hobbes on human motion. Human beings are other, there are also bodies in motion. Think, for example, about emotions, the term emotions, right? You're moved by something, and there's so something going on inside of you that's a reaction to something out there. Hobbes says, for there is no such Venus ultimus utmost end, aim, or summum bonum, greatest good as is spoken of in the books of the old moral philosophers. So people like Aristotle. Human beings naturally move toward an end, a greatest end, a final end, or something like that, and other God's values too. Hobbes says, nope. All it is is bodies in motion. He goes on, therefore, so that in the first place I put for a general inclination of all mankind a perpetual and restless desire of power after power that ceases only in death. That's one of the most famous, that's a red line quotation uh, in the history of political thought. Human beings are bodies in motion. What they want to do is prevent stopping that motion, death. What they want to do is keep that motion going, but each motion is just a motion to the next motion. There's no meaning, intrinsic meaning in human life. It's just staying in motion. Okay, now I've spent just a little bit more time on Hobbes here in order to see transition to Rousseau. For, uh, for Hobbes also, the state is a machine, an artificial body that we create to serve human ends. Okay, what's Hobbes and modernity now about to transition to Rousseau? <clears throat> Hope that from the, just the glimpses you've seen of the thinkers I've briefly covered, and especially Hobbes, a couple of things that Rousseau's reacting to. Again, particularly with Hobbes. Number one, Everything is matter in motion, including human beings. And the motion is directionless. There's no intrinsic up or down or good or bad or anything like that in the motion. It's just motion. Number two, there's no good or evil by nature. <clears throat> so nature doesn't give us moral guidance in any way. We have to give ourselves that own, our own guidance, and there's no intrinsic good and evil to do that. Three, all ends become means. Okay? So I think money is a great example here, and I think you saw, you read Locke's second treatise and the chapter on property. You can think of it in this way if you want to, in part at least, which is, what do I want to do? I want to get stuff. <laughs> What's the best stuff I can get? Money, because money is a fungible means I can use to get any end I want, right? So there's nothing intrinsically good about money except that it's a means to other ends. Hobbes turns everything into means. Okay, no proper leader, no proper ends other than our goals. <clears throat> Three, we're all equal. But in, in, in Hobbes' world, although that does have a notion of natural right, of equality, there is that kernel there. In large measure, it just means we're all interchangeable <laughs> um, uh, beings here. Okay, and part of his argument is you need to recognize you're just an interchangeable being. Your mother was wrong, you're not special. Uh, <laughs> is, is how I'd summarize Hobbes. And then finally, on um, here, self-interest. Hobbes reduces us to self-interest. That's what motivates us, and we can turn all of our actions into self-interested actions in a very reductionist way. At least that's how Hobbes presents himself. So that's known as what we would call methodological individualism. You may have heard that in political science or other social science classes. In other words, I'm going to assume that we are, by nature, fundamentally individuals who are self-interested. That's the starting point assumption. How many of you have been introduced to uh, game theory, for example? Okay, or an econ, economics? That's the basic assumption here, and that comes out of the Hobbesian kind of way. And you know, a lot of them admit, well, I know this, not really like that, but a simplifying assumption. So one of the arguments about Hobbes is, is it a simplifying assumption, or does he really believe it? Some of these other things seem to suggest he really believes it. When he talks about human relationships, okay, imagine that it's, it's Valentine's. You want to curl up with a good romantic book with your partner. And you discover that the reason you're going to have a family is because you need little allies in your war of everyone against everyone. That's what Hobbes <laughs> says. Okay? Um, and, you know, and you need a partner, love, for that. But love is basically, well, I'm going to get something out of this, namely pleasure and little allies. Uh, <laughs> friendship for Hobbes is ut simply utilitarian. Right? You know, I don't really like you because you're you. I like you because you're going to be useful to me. My little war of everyone against everyone, uh, as he says here. 
So Hobbes reduces these relationships to self-interested calculation. And then finally, politics. As I said, the state is a machine for Hobbes. Politics is how do we stay alive? Well, the best way to stay alive is to ally together to stay alive against those other people, uh, right? And um, that condition uh, of allying together is to bring peace so that we can use the scientific method to better our world. But fundamentally, it's about getting stuff, right? It's about utility and increasing our utility, okay? So I hope you can see uh, it, that when, when I said Rousseau is worried about how modernity here captured by Hobbes, modernity flattens our relationships, flattens our data, ideas about virtue, about love, about friendship, about politics. So what Rousseau is going to do is embrace in a certain way the principles of Hobbes and the modern philosophers, and then try and reanimate, reconstruct human relationships on that basis that makes them meaningful again. Okay, let me pause. Questions before I turn back to Rousseau? Next time, you okay? We're okay. <clears throat> okay, let's go back. Here we are. Okay, let me give you a sense of what Rousseau says about modern life. You saw it in your readings, particularly, I think, in the beginning of the first discourse when Rousseau, the discourse on science starts when Rousseau talks about civility. So everything looks nice, everyone's being polite and friendly, but then you discover it's all a mask, right? They're all fakers, right? And they just want your stuff, right? They're being polite to you as an instrumental means, not because they're truly polite. All of our relationships become these sort of phony relationships. So let me give you a sense of a couple of things he says in another work, a meal, which I know you're uh, familiar with too, uh, not familiar with reading it, but having read, read something I wrote about it. So we can talk more about that later. Uh, here are a couple of things he says about modern people. The creatures of modernity, let's call it. Okay. Always in contradiction with himself, always floating between his inclinations and his duties, he, modern man, modern civil man, will never be either man or citizen. He will be good neither for himself nor for others. He will be one of these men of our days, a bourgeois. He will be nothing. So he doesn't have strength or unity of soul that a citizen would have, for example, an ancient you know, kind of model of a citizen. He's just a kind of a creature of his inclinations and his duties. And this is, by the way, another exciting uh, moment for you, as it is for me. Uh, this is the first use of the term bourgeois in Western intellectual history in the way that we would use the term bourgeois. Or bourgeois, as my daughter says. I still don't know what that means. Everything turns out to be bourgeois, uh, from her at least. Um, another quick quotation. Public instruction, by the way, he links that, he uh, gives Plato's Republic as an example of that. You read Plato's Republic? Plato's re in, uh, public instruction no longer exists and can no longer exist because there is no, where there is no longer fatherland, there can no longer be citizens. Now, there are a number of causes that Rousseau thinks there are no longer fatherlands and citizens, uh, but, but the idea, of looking back at Hobbes, right? If you're a member of Hobbes' state as a machine, you're not a citizen in the full sense of the term. You're just inhabiting and part of a machine, trying to get your stuff. You know, so the idea of citizen virtue, self-sacrifice, patriotism is dead, according to Rousseau. Finally, <coughs> So Emile's an educational treatise, at least in appearance. Nor do I count the education of society, so we no longer have public instruction, so what about the education we get in society? Nor do I count that, because this education, tending toward two contrary ends, fails to attain either, is, made, is fit only for making double men, always appearing to relate everything to others, and never relating anything except to themselves alone. So here you have this notion of civility. Under the cover of pretending to care about you, what I'm really trying to do is get my stuff. So let's think about some of these um, interactions you see in stores or coffee shops. You know, oh, you know, you know how are you today? Um, oh gosh, could I have you know skim milk in my latte? Oh, and don't make that too. You know, all of a sudden it's like, well, what's, who's this interaction really about? Right, this interaction is really about me trying to get the latte I want, and I'm just pretending to care about the person behind the counter, for example. <clears throat> I just did that this morning, so it's fresh. <laughs> okay, so this is just a tidbit here of Rousseau's diagnosis of modern society. Okay. 
let's go back to the discourse on the science start to start to see the problem. Okay. Again, the thesis, apparent thesis of the discourse on the sciences and arts is that the restoration of the sciences and arts, the enlightenment, the renaissance, modernity, the restoration of the sciences and arts has corrupted morals. Okay. So that's the apparent argument of the work. Okay. But there's some problems that maybe you um, encountered and talked about in class, I don't know. He begins the work proper by praising enlightenment. It's a grand and beautiful sight to see man emerge from obscurity somehow by his own efforts, dissipate the light of reason, etc. Right? It's a praise. So why, if his argument is enlightenment corrupts us, why begin with the praise of enlightenment? It gets worse. His statement of his argument in the work, he puts it in terms of cause and effect. Where there's no effect, there's no cause to seek, but here the effect is certain, depravity real, and our souls have been corrupted in proportion to our sciences and arts have advanced toward perfection. Shall it be said this is a misfortune particular to our age? No, <coughs> gentlemen, the evils caused by our vain curiosity is old of the world. The daily rise and fall of the ocean's waters have not been more regularly have subjected to the course of star, etc. Right? So the tides from the moon, right? So he likens his argument about the relationship between the sciences and the arts to, a, to moral corruption as being akin to a scientific argument about nature. So in other words, Rousseau uses science to critique the effects of science. So the discourse on the sciences and the arts is a scientific or philosophic argument about the effects of the sciences and arts. Contrast that, for example, to Christian, certain Christian or Republican critiques of the sciences and arts. Right? So Rousseau, again, is coming at it from inside the, the bosom of the Enlightenment or modernity to critique the Enlightenment or modernity, not from the outside, like man's a fallen creature or something like that. He, so he does it from within. He adopts the principles of science to critique science itself. <clears throat> Finally, and you, I'm sure you require this, he concludes the work with a praise of Enlightenment and modernity. Those whom nature is destined to be her disciples needed no teachers. Virulent, that's Bacon. Descartes, we saw those guys, Newton, he's been mentioned, right? These preceptors of the human race had none themselves for these few to rise, raise monuments to the glory of human intellect. So in a work that critiques modern science or modernity, the heroes of whom are Bacon, Descartes, and Newton, Rousseau praises them while critiquing the effects of what they've done or, or in general. So, there's the, 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 the tangle, the knot that makes Rousseau, for me, very interesting, right? Is if this had just been a critique of the effects of the sciences and arts. He says, well, look around you, you know, look at all these people at the coffee shop being rude to one another. That's terrible. There must be fallen preachers or something like this. That wouldn't be very interesting, at least to me, to, to use the tools of science itself or philosophy itself or modernity itself to critique modernity. That's interesting and a very complex argument. <clears throat> it's captured, and I don't know if you talked about this, by the uh, frontispiece. So the frontispiece of the Discourse on the Science Arts, which is included in your edition, is it was, it was free. There's a, you know, lanyap, as they say. Anyone know that term? No one knows lanyap? It's good with donuts. So lanyap is it's a Cajun term. It's something you get extra. So imagine you go and get the donuts, you say, hey, I have a crawler too. That's a lanyap. Okay, so the illustrations are lanyaps uh, in this work. So uh, this is Prometheus bringing the light of the sciences and arts to mankind, right? And then you have the satyr over here who wants to embrace the fire. And Prometheus warns him, satire, you do not know it. In other words, you don't know that the fire is going to burn you. That's the subtitle that Rousseau gives for the engraving. Okay? Satire, you did not know it, it's going to burn you. But the continuation of the quotation and the source from which Rousseau took, takes it says, it burns when one touches it, but it gives light and warmth and is an implement for serving all arts, providing one knows how to use it well. So in other words, Rousseau's argument is actually not that the sciences and arts corrupt morals or burn us necessarily. It depends on how they're used and who uses them. So in the frontispiece itself, 
the complicated uh, critique of modernity within itself is present. Okay, so I just wanted to show you that. Let's come back very briefly to Illumination of Valsen. Okay? And I understand that it was in this class that read my article. So you, you'll have a flavor of this about the visual education here. And I just wanted to give you a little flavor of, um, of something I'm doing we can talk about. Okay? <clears throat> This is him talking about that Saul on the road to Damascus moment. Okay. I'm hoping in Idaho people know what that means. In California, you say that, and no one knows what you mean. Okay, you have to use like California dreaming. You know, I walked into a church. Okay. You only you get that. Okay, oh sir, if I'd ever been able to write a quarter of what I saw and felt under that tree, I would make the contradiction of the social system seen, and so on. So Rousseau uses visual imagery here. He's in an illumination. He's seen something, and his goal is to help you, the reader of his work, see what he's seen. And see that far from the social institutions making us better, or to generalize modernity make us better, it actually leads to our corruption. So it's a matter of training us to see properly. So with that in mind, let me come back to the discourse on inequality and focus in on a couple of points there to, to talk about his critique of modernity and the complexities of it. Okay. So again, with the image of seeing here, and I think you read this in your last class, this particular passage, I would guess. Um, this is in the preface to the work, um, or exordium. Exordium to the work. He says this. The philosophers who have examined the foundations of society have all felt the necessity of going back to the state of nature, but none of them has reached it. Okay. So the philosophers who have gone back to the state of nature would include Hobbes, whom I mentioned, Locke, whom you read, and Rousseau himself, uh, as you'll see in the discourse on inequality and social contract. Okay? So he's proclaiming, in other words, his allegiance to this way of approaching matters. So the philosophers who have examined the foundations of society have all felt the necessity of going back to the state of nature. That's simply a lie. Okay? Aristotle didn't talk about the state of nature. Plato didn't talk about the state of nature. Machiavelli didn't talk about the state of nature, etc. Right? So by critiquing his predecessors, Hobbes and Locke, for example, Rousseau is actually joining them. So here you have another example of him uh, adopting the tools of modernity, in this case, state of nature, to use it against him. Okay, why haven't they succeeded? In short, all of them speaking continuing of need, greed, oppression, desires, and pride have carried into state of nature ideas they've taken from society. They spoke of savage man, and they were depicting, again, a visual notion, civil man. So in other words, they assume that the beings they have in front of them, right, modern, social, human beings, are representatives of nature. Rousseau argued, no. They are artificial creatures, and in order to see what's actually natural, you have to dig beneath that surface. So they made a simple methodological mistake. <coughs> and again, to put it in terms of using tools of modernity, he's saying they're right to go to the state of nature, but they should have gone further. Right? They should have carried the, this argument further and seen that they were accepting some things as being true that are in fact false. As their appearance is not reality. Again, looking at this notion of visual. And how, this is the very beginning of the exordium, and how will man ever manage to see himself as nature formed him through all the changes the sequence and times must have produced in his original constitution. I'm sure you read this passage. Like the statue of Glaucus, which time sees storms and so disfigured it resembled less a god and a ferocious beast. The human soul, altered in the bosom of society by a thousand continually renewed causes, has, so to speak, changed in appearance to the point of being nearly unrecognizable. So again, what we take to be our present, our nature, is in fact just our present nature, and it's the uh, outcome of a, of a historical process, an environmental process. And you know, I think you saw Rousseau entertain the idea that there are physical changes, something like a Darwinian uh, evolution of, of us physically um, in his work. He doesn't pursue that one for various reasons. But he's talking about uh, radical changes in our nature. So what we take, looking before our eyes, what we take to be human nature is in fact not human nature. So he's got to convince you that he's right. How does he do it? Visual images, <laughs> okay? This is the very beginning of the first part. Stripping this being, man, 
human being, of all the supernatural gifts he could have received and all the artificial faculties he could have acquired only by prolonged progress, considering him in a word, such as he must have come from the hands of nature, I see an animal less strong than some, etc. I see him satisfying his hunger beneath an oak, quenching his thirst for stream, finding his bed at the foot of the same tree that furnished his meal, and there, and with that, his needs satisfied. So this is the initial portrait of natural man. You remember this? So what he's got to do through the rest of the first part of the work, which is what you read last time, what he's got to do in the rest of the first part is persuade you this could possibly be true. Right? And again, we can talk more about it, but one of the ways he does it, if, if you look back um, at, at that account, is he's constantly contrasting natural man and civil man. Okay, so for example, he talks about how robust natural man is. How, um, uh, you know, the, his need to survive makes him strong. And then after having done that, he pits him in a fight against civil man. He said, oh, well, civil man, with all his weapons and stuff, he can, you know, beat natural man, but take away all civil man's weapons, and there you're going to see natural man kick his butt. And the next thing you know, you're rooting for natural man, right? And you're like, yeah, natural man, you know, kick civil man's butt. All of a sudden, natural man has become real to you, right? So Rousseau is able to persuade you by these kinds of images and so on. And again, we can talk about that. Let us therefore beware of confusing savage man with the men we have before our eyes. Right? So Rousseau's got to get you to imagine a world is different than the one you see, and believe that that world's the real world, and that the world you see is actually the world of appearances. And so he's got to use all the tricks and imagination, rhetorical tools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, he finally comes forward with a sort of the idea that's behind this whole process, and that is, and it's been implicit throughout the account. Um, for example, that statue of Glaucus is, appears today different than it used to be. The presumption there is it changed. Okay? So Rousseau's central doctrine, and this is, I think, key to understanding his place in modernity, is the doctrine of perfectibility. Again, I think you were introduced to this last class. He's writing here, he's looked at natural man as a physical being, and he turns to the metaphysical and moral side. In other words, his psychology. And he asks, what's the difference between man and the animal? His first answer is free will. Then he's like, well, <laughs> but there might be some arguments about that. So I'm going to come up with a different answer. But even if the difficulties surrounding all these questions concerning free will should leave some room for dispute concerning this difference between man and animal, there is another very specific quality that distinguishes them and about which there can be no argument. That is the faculty of perfecting himself. A faculty which, with the aid of circumstances, successfully develops all the others and resides in us as much in the species as in the individual. And he names this in the next sentence, perfectibility. Now this is absolutely hilarious. Now why is this hilarious? So Rousseau says, you know, this free will stuff, it's complicated. So, but there's something else that we can all agree on. We're distinguished from the animals by perfectibility. Now, given that Rousseau made up that word, and this is the first time he ever used it, it's kind of funny that he thinks there can be no dispute about it. Like, okay, yeah, you're right, perfectibility, you know, whatever that is, that seems good. Um, so his argument is that human beings, unlike animals, change, both on the individual and the species level, to a degree that is qualitatively different. Okay? So his argument is this, this potentiality, perfectibility, let's call it malleability, the malleability of human nature. The malleability of human nature is actually the ground for all the characteristics that we have assumed previously are distinct about human beings. Freedom, reason, speech, sociability, etc., etc. So Rousseau thinks he can explain all the qualities of human nature with this one notion of malleability or perfectibility. Of course, he uses it in a rather ironic way. Perfectibility is you can become an idiot. Uh, um, <laughs> So perfectibility in his hands, at least in second discourse, is generally our ability to deteriorate or become corrupted. That's again a complicated story. Okay? <clears throat> and so given this, what he's able to do is pro provide a human psychology, a doctrine of human nature that's both analytic and synthetic. Analytic, you boil it down to its bare parts. Synthetic, you build it back up. 
uh, uh, interesting. So again, analysis and synthesis are the methods of modern natural science. He's using these methods in his own domain. He, are, he writes here shortly after a perfectibility passage, whatever the moralist may say about it, human understanding owes much to the passions, which is his generally acknowledged owe much to it as well. It's by their activity our reason is perfected, the passions in turn derive their origins from our needs and their progress from our knowledge. Okay? I understand that you had something that looked very much like this uh, by chance, perhaps. Uh, so this, although I understand, is reversed uh, uh, because of some you know, the the arrows going in the same direction. teleological assumptions that your professor made that I'm not going to. Uh, but, so the idea here is this: we have needs, and those needs um, are activated or pursued by our passions. Right. So, for example, we have a need to continue the species. We have a sexual passion. Um, and then we use reason to satisfy those needs and passions. The amount of reason you have is directly <coughs> proportional to how many needs and passions you have. Okay. So Rousseau's argument, <clears throat> and this by the way is just straight out of Hobbes and Locke. This is Hobbes and Locke in psychology. But Rousseau's argument again is they assumed that the being that's the end of this process is human nature. And he's going to go back and show you that all these attributes that we've assumed are natural to us are, in fact, acquired. How does he do that? Analysis. Right? He boils down natural man's needs to the bare physical minimum. And his argument is if we have these bare physical minimum needs, we therefore have very limited passions, and therefore we have very limited faculties, including reason. On the other hand, once there's a change in our environment, and that's what second part of second discourse, which you're going to talk about today. Once you have a change in that environment, our needs increase, therefore our passions increase, and there are reason, and it's dynamic, right? Once I develop reason, I'm up there climbing the tree, you know, coconut. Okay, I climb up and get the coconut. And I'm up there and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm going to be hungry tomorrow. I better get another coconut. Wait a minute, I'm gonna be hungry next week. I better get three coconuts. Wait a minute, you know, Bill's gonna come get my coconuts. I better build a fort and then have a family and defenders and you know this kind of stuff, right? So we end up with this once we have foresight, imagination, and reason, our needs increase because we have future need now. For example. Okay? So he analyzes down to ground zero, natural man, the state of nature, and he's gonna synthesize in the second part of the work. So he's using the same psychological theory as his predecessors in order to critique them and show how we eventually become like they assume that we are by nature, but we aren't. So, there we are, the familiar thing. We go from the natural man to civil man, and then he's also gonna show us how we degenerate uh, into the bourgeois. <laughs> so that's what his argument, he's gonna show you how we can be all these different creatures, and creatures is a proper word here. Hope there are no fans. Okay, let me repeat the theses here uh, very quickly, okay? So Rousseau is the first great crit critic of mod modernity within the modern fold. He uses the tools of modernity, modern science, etc., in order to critique it. Second, and this is where I'm going to turn now, he reconstructs virtue, love, etc., um, while granting the grounds but then coming to different conclusions. And then finally, it has the paradoxical effect of accelerating certain aspects of modernity. So let me now show just a couple of quick examples here. Rousseau's reconstruction of love. Okay. This is also from your reading in the second discourse. He distinguished between physical love, which is the mere desire to mate, and we need that to keep the species going. And according to him, you know, any male or any female, it goes both ways, uh, is good enough for him. Because he doesn't have the mind to discriminate. You know, natural man doesn't have preferences between blondes and brunettes, and natural woman doesn't have preferences between uh, whatever the preferences are <laughs> um, here. Um, but the moral element, as he calls it, and moral here, you might even translate something like social, the social element of love, is once we develop and we do have preferences, um, of ma mating preferences, um, then we have specific characteristics that we desire and seek out. Okay. So. Notice that, I mean, Rousseau really reduces love down even further than Hobbes, right? Love is just, you know, uh, the passing desire for sex. 
But on top of that, you know, very reductionist notion of love, of sexual passion, he's going to build up romantic love uh, here. Um, and it, this happens in the second discourse, so I thought I'd point to it. Everything begins to change appearances with young people of different sexes and having neighborhood huts. The intermittent interactions demanded by nature soon lean to another kind, no less sweet and more permanent through visiting one another. They grew accustomed, grow accustomed to consider different objects and make comparisons. So blondes, brunettes, um, good dancer, bad dancer. Uh, by dint of seeing one another, they can no longer uh, do without seeing one another again. So the way I like to explain this is the junior high school dance. Uh, this is what happens there. Uh, and there's this awkward mating ritual where people have preferences. I want to dance with so-and-so, and then so-and-so doesn't want to dance with me, and then I'm in the bathroom crying because so-and-so doesn't want to dance with me. That's the dynamic here, right? But that's the birth of romantic love for all its costs and benefits from the basic physical love. So again, a reductionist blown is romantic love. So this is Rousseau's story in the Second Discourse of the fall, right? You got a tree, you got lust, and you've got pride. It's all there. Rousseau's argument is they didn't fall through some fall of their own, they were thrown into the high school dance. Uh, and so, and then these things happen. Or is it a happy fall of us? Right? Because after all, natural man, natural woman experiencing only physical love, they're animals. Right? They're, they're not properly human. Now they're properly human if somewhat corrupted by this process. So is it a happy fall? I have absolutely no interest whatsoever, by the way, in uh, Prince, who, which one is that? Harry and Meghan Markle. It's all over the tabloids, so I thought I'd use it. Okay, so is this a good or a bad thing? And the answer is yes. Uh, so he reconstructs love, and here's a quotation from Emile. There's no true love without enthusiasm, no enthusiasm with an object of perfection, real or ephemeral, always existing in imagination. So re Rousseau reconstructs love, romantic love, as a matter of our imagination and so on. And he wrote the most popular novel of the 18th century, the best-selling novel of the 18th century, which is a love story, Julia the Nouvelle Louise. So he actually put his money where his mouth was, or vice versa, uh, um, to write a romantic novel. Quickly, Rousseau's reconstruction of politics, and you're gonna see a little bit of this next time. He again begins with self-interest, just like Hobbes, right? But rather than sticking with simple self-interest, Rousseau wants to transform that self-interest or self-love into patriotism. Here's one quotation quickly. <clears throat> the commitments that bind us, you're gonna read this next time, I think. The commitments that bind us to the social body are obligatory only because they are mutual. So far, Hobbes agrees. And their, or Locke agrees, and their nature is such that in fulfilling them, one cannot work for someone else without also working for oneself. So self-interest and altruism, let's say, start to go together. Why is the general will always right, and why do all constantly will the happiness of each one of them, if not because there's no one who does not appropriate the word each to himself, and who does not consider himself when voting for all? This proves the equality right and notion of justice produces derives from the preference that each person has for himself and consequently from the nature of man. So Rousseau begins with the Hobbesian or Lockean premise. We're all self-interested. That's our nature. But by properly orienting our self-interest, we can make ourselves into citizens, true citizens again. My example, <clears throat> how many of you have done team sports before? Yeah? Right? And you notice that the coach, like you, someone screws up and everyone has to run around all the time. That's not to make you better shape, although it does have that effect. It's to make you break down your individuality and think as a team. Right? So that when you walk into the voting booth, how many of you are political science majors? Okay, I'll, I'll, almost all of you. You know, you know what they, all your, your political science professors say? Oh, it's all self-interest. You walk in the voting booth and say, what's good for me? So it says, that's not good enough. You know, when you want people to walk in the voting booth and say, What's good for us, right? So what's good for me as a citizen of the United States or Idaho or whatever it is? So he wants to transform self-interest into interest of, of patriotism, let's say. And he, you have to do this by transforming human nature. I'll, uh, and I'll leave that uh, aside from that. Okay, 
So um, Rousseau, in a way, can be thought of returning to the ancients or ancient ideas of politics based on modern principles. He's going to accept self-interest, self-love, a la Hobbes and Locke and so on, but he's going to build up something that looks much more like ancient patriotism and civic virtue on that ground. So for him, the sort of bourgeois citizen is not good enough. The bourgeois citizen is ultimately neither good for himself nor others. Rousseau wants to transform human nature by beginning with human nature itself and make us good for ourselves and good for others. So in one way you might look at what he's doing is going backwards from modern principles. But of course, some people thought it was moving forward. Here Rousseau, um, the French revolutionaries loved him so much they dug him up, dragged him to Paris, playing his music while they watched, and then bury him in the Pantheon, uh, across from Voltaire, his mortal enemy, which is a great, delicious thing. Okay, so there's Rousseau's tomb in the Pantheon. So the French revolutionaries saw themselves, or at least claimed they saw themselves, as followers of Rousseau. Now Rousseau, in his writings, in Emile in particular, he says the age of revolution is coming. He predicts the age of revolutions, French Revolution, you know, 30 years after he's writing, but he wasn't very optimistic about what the results would be <laughs> from such revolutions. But at any rate, so does Rousseau go back to the ancients or does he somehow move us forward to the revolutionary uh, movements of the 19th and 20th century? That's a big argument uh, in, in the field. Now, I mentioned to you, perfectibility is a central core concept here, the idea that human beings are malleable, uh, and this can explain how you could be both national man and civil man and a bourgeois, et cetera. Here are just a couple of quotations. Rousseau had immense influence on philosophy. So, um, for example, Kant, Hegel, Marx, uh, among others, all look to Rousseau and react to him. He had immense influence on um, the arts, the romanticism, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so, on both sides of the, um, of the debates about these things, uh, Rousseau is claimed He's claimed by the people who say, oh, the modernity made a terrible turn with the French Revolution. Rousseau warned us. And then other people say, oh, Rousseau caused the French Revolution. He's the bad guy. So people are, you know, take Rousseau on each side of these. Here's just a couple of quick quotations that happen to be on the internet. Uh, this is William Godwin, who is a great fan, an English uh, author, a great fan of the, um, of the French Revolution, also the, the father of uh, Mary Shelley of Frankenstein fame. Perfectibility is the one most unequivocal characteristics of the human species. And by that, he means this. Okay, he thinks that perfectibility can change the world. Edgar Allan Poe, a much more sober man, in my opinion, said, I have no faith in human perfectibility. So this is just a little bit later. We have not, in fact, become better. And then John Stiebeck, since I'm from California now, said that unless you believe in perfectibility, you have no business being an author which is something that Dostoevsky, among others, might have had something to say about. Okay, so the notion of Rousseau's ideas and his influence and thought are still very much a matter of debate. Um, so with that, I'll conclude, and thank you, and just three minutes over. <laughs> so we'll take uh, 10 minutes of questions, we'll break, and then we'll come back for so. Thank you, yeah. Why does Rousseau refer to Asian as, what was it, Virulum? Yeah. He's bacon virulum. Excuse me, Baron Ber virulum. Uh, um, and maybe he was kosher, I'm not sure, but um, Baron virulum. And so he was often referred to by that name. Um, so I'm not, but you know, with Rousseau, you got to suspect there's something else going on too. And here's, I think, the answer to that. He hints at it in that same context in the first discourse. Bacon was not only bacon of science fame, he was the Lord Chancellor of England. Uh, in other words, uh, he was something like a philosopher king, uh, you might say, or in, in Rousseau's mind. So I think he might use Virulim, his sort of official title, to point to the fact that Bacon wasn't merely a scientist. He was trying to use science uh, to wed it to politics. That's my guess, but that's just one of his titles. He could have said St. Albans, too, but it's not as good. Yes? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so one thing that I was thinking about when you uh, brought up the coconut analogy is how did natural man actually survive? He couldn't think that he needed to defend himself at any point from any threats. How did he think that plays out if he didn't have any idea that he needed to go farmers? Like, I feel like the species would just go extinct because they didn't know how to defend themselves. 
Yeah, uh, well, I think there, there are two answers to that, an, an easy answer and a hard answer. Um, the easy answer is this. If you look back and read his account of the state of nature, the, sort of the original state of nature, you'll see it's not nearly as nice as it appears at first. So at one point he says, you know, savage man, you know, natural man, whatever, can, you know, use a stick as a weapon. You know, so apparently he's got to use a weapon. Uh, another example, my favorite one, is when he's talking about how we're rendered robust by nature. He says, the nature treats all of her creatures precisely as the law of Sparta does. She renders strong those who survive and kills the rest. So, you know, despite the sort of fuzzy, romantic sort of view of, oh, nature seems nice, peaceful, you know, et cetera, it actually isn't when you look at the details. So he's perfectly aware of that. That's the easy answer. Here's the hard answer. If natural man is wandering around with a stick beating on things, hasn't perfectibility already begun? Right? So Rousseau wants to argue that in the natural condition, we are simply animals, that we are not perfected. That only happens later and by accident. But if you look at the details, it appears that natural man is always um, capable of perfection, perfectibility. By inventing weapons, Rousseau admits that we may have invented speech. He admits that we imitate other animals in the state of nature. Those all seem to be rather complex mental operations that he allows um, there. So there's debate about what do we do with that um, question. He's clearly aware of it. You know. um, I, here's my um, argument. Um, see, how do I want to do this? I'll do it like this. I wish I could reverse the uh, axes, right? That is, we have the x and the y-axis here, okay, and this is zero. Here's my, uh, my sense, is that what Rousseau is doing is he's taking you to an asymptotic kind of function here. In other words, um, we're never at zero. We're never simply completely unperfected. He's just using a thought experiment to take us back as far close to zero as he can get us, right? And then once there's a kind of accident that leads to development across the species, then you're, boom, there you go. So his argument, you know, it has to be some, I think something like this. So he allows for nature not being so kind and us having to adapt to it. His argument has to be it's not so unkind uh, and our adapt, ad adaptions are not so great as to, as to really change the situation. So good, uh, yeah, good question. <clears throat> yes? So with his, like, ideal, like more simplistic to end a bunch of our needs so it would lessen our passions, just be more utopic, I guess? Well, that's a good question and a very difficult one to answer, in part because um, Rousseau presents a number of possible options, okay? Um, so for example, you'll see in the social contract when you read that, that number one, Rousseau argues that as far as a political society goes, the only legitimate form of political society is direct democracy. He's the first person to argue that uh, in the history, important thinker to argue that uh, in the history of Western thought. So we take that for granted. He argues it as a new position in 1762. But, and, and he also argues that the best form of that kind of democratic society is, is more simple in, in certain kinds of ways. It's more likely to last and be effective if it's simple. Precisely because all these fancy needs and stuff lead us to inequality and lack of, and non-democratic things. But Rousseau also appears not to be super optimistic that such societies are possible, at least in modern times. So, for example, in some of his other works, Emile, the one I quoted from about the bourgeois, and Julie, his novel, romantic love novel, in those cases he argues that the best solution is actually retreating from society. You know, so he's got a country mouse, city mouse story, uh, right? So city mouse bad, country mouse good. Uh, so is a country mouse guy, Hob city mouse. Uh, so it'd be better to go off and buy a farm someplace in the middle of, uh, well, I would say Idaho, that starts getting a little charged, uh, and, and you know, um, having a much simpler society. But he, I think the ultimate answer is Rousseau doesn't think there's a great solution. He thinks, in my opinion, Rousseau's less about solutions than he is about identifying the problem. 
So if at least you understand that your desire to have a nicer car in order to look better than the Joneses <laughs> is leading you down the path of corruption, then you're better off. That's, that's my opinion. Now, let me... So we still have to think that institutions are kind of the root of like, man's evil and why we perceive human Or certain institutions, the institutions that we have, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But it seems like his idea of perfectibility leads to institutions. Yep. So how do those two things coincide? In the same way that a nice um, uh, uh, steak leads you to indigestion the next day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so yeah, you, you, uh, that perfectibility uh, is a two-edged sword. Right? On the one hand, perfectibility enables us to become human. So, for example, physical love, becoming romantic, or John Locke. Right? Um, uh, on the other hand, well, to take that example, the, the love example, since he uses it, um, on the one hand, we're now human. Uh, we have the imagination, the faculties, the dance lessons that make us fully human. But on the other hand, we're also that comes with for Rousseau a kernel of corruption, right? And you know, just think about any movie that has to do with you know, like high school, uh, any decent movie that has to do with high school. Is it may be that in the end, you know, the two uh, sixteen candles, you know, they get together in the end, and everything's hunky dory. But along the way, there's a lot of pain, <laughs> you know, of, of pride, of injured self, um, um, self. What, what do I want? self-image, uh, and so on and so forth. So in other words, uh, for Rousseau, I think there's always a balanced ledger. And likewise with these institutions. These institutions in principle, uh, so natural man's state of nature is not a member of a direct democracy. He's not a citizen. He's not virtuous in any way. Perfectibility makes us capable of constructing a democracy, of being true citizens, of being truly virtuous. But Rousseau's argument, at a great cost, I think. Yeah. That was basically. I, I have a question that's similar to that. Um, can you talk about or how do perfectibility and a flattened world relate to one another? By which I mean, yeah. When I, when I hear the word perfectible, I think of the high and the low. Mm -hmm. And what I take you to mean by the flattened world is that all is under self-interest <clears throat> so how do those two things or does he reject one of those two things it's a good question I think um, yes yeah, so a perfectibility in Rousseau's hands allows both for the recreation of um, high and low uh, that something like the ancient or Christian thinkers would have thought was natural um, so take um, uh, two examples, uh, Justice and Eros. So Justice and Eros for in Platonic thought, for example, um, uh, that these are natural to us, they need to be cultivated in certain ways, uh, and so on and so forth, but they're, they're natural parts. Of, so the high and low are natural to human beings in some way. Um, I think for Rousseau, perfectibility allows for the possibility of high and low, romantic love as opposed to mere just some sexual coupling, for example, to use that example. Um, uh, it makes possible true justice through democratic regime and so on. Um, uh, based on a different understanding of the ancients, but it makes possible those things again. But um, <clears throat> it also makes possible for a re-leveling in a different way. So think about the state of nature with natural man. It's level. It's a level playing field. There's no substantial inequalities among people that matter for them, assuming they survive. Um, um, and so uh, everyone's equal in a kind of way. Um, with the corrupted forms of perfectibility, we all return in this part of the story, the second part of the second discourse, which we'll talk about later, there's a kind of return to that, but on a base kind of level. Now everyone's a bourgeois, a member of society, driven by self-interest, but, but required to hide that self-interest in order to make it more effective. And so, um, so, for example, natural man 
simply acts out of his self-interest or self-love, without any idea of how others perceive him, without caring how, or being able to even imagine how they care, whether they care about him. But now in society, um, even though I'm this you know, bourgeois, self-interested person, um, I realize that in order to get what I want, I have to think about how other people think about me. And I actually have to care about how other people think about me. I need to manipulate them into caring about me, <laughs> for example, uh, in ways that leads to satisfaction with self-interest. So it's a kind of leveling in the sense I've used it. It becomes, we're now more cognitively able than natural man. I can think, okay, now wait a minute. If I say this to you, you're going to react this way. Therefore, you know, I can think about these things. Natural man can't do that. But I'm doing it all because I want, you know, the goodies. Uh, and so I've lost the high and low in a, in a meaningful way. I mean, just think about, you know, these things are in the air these days. I, uh, again, Rousseau uses sexual passions, so I'll use it too. So it's not me. It's the Kardashians, that was me. Okay. Um, is if romance, if, if romantic relationships are merely about getting the other person in bed, and all you're doing is a kind of conniving thing, you know, you're bringing flowers and, you know, whatever, just for that mere purpose, and everyone's aware of it, and just think how, you know, impoverished that is. And that's the, Rousseau thinks that's the kind of world we're living in. Um, and uh, sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking that we're, you know, getting the flowers for noble purposes, but we're not, um, to use that kind of example. And in politics, same kind of thing. And think about interest group politics, right? We, we learned about this in American politics, and we think, oh, well, you know, different interests, they should be able to you know, bargain and representatives represent those interests and so on. And Rousseau is like, seriously? You know, this is just more organized, you know, selfishness. Um, that's not real politics. How many minutes do you have? Let's take a break. We'll come back after afterward. Open up for questions. Thank you. Thank you.